World Witchery. We are high priesthood representing the Alexandrian witchcraft tradition and in general British traditional witchcraft. And we've been recording this show for, this is our fourth year. Mm -hmm. It's my second year. And we've absolutely loved the interaction with the people that watch, the questions and the content we've gotten. This season, season four, episode six, we have an ambush live interview person that's well versed in the traditions of witchcraft call in with questions we have no idea what they are and what the subject is today's today's guest is high priestess christine stevens high priestess in our alexandrian lineage and tradition traveler of the world brilliant beautiful woman and we are very excited about what she might ask us to watch covendom uh, live or in later on we are on youtube facebook and hex education channel on youtube please subscribe to hex education we've got a lot on there already posted and some new ch- shows and things coming up soon and we have and i'm going to introduce us we also have in the last 30 minutes of the show call in opportunity for you our viewers and which friends to call and ask questions about the topic we're I on i won't be mean this time i promise 309-463-3377-309 goddess and the lovely and beautiful people that are here tonight are brian kane from salem massachusetts who is there at his home and temple he is high priest of the new orleans coven Levi Rowland is here in the shop, and he is a proud homeowner. Oh, he, yes, that just happened. He closed on his house, and now he is an absolute homeowner in, in New Orleans. It's and he's so high priest in Alexandrian tradition. He has his own coven, the Pontchartrain Coven in New Orleans. And I'm Ellie Barnes, high priestess of the New Orleans Coven, honored to be working with Brian and all of the lovely witches here. Um, yeah. You did great. Okay, I did great. <laughs> I did great. We're moving to Levi with the news. Levi with the news. I feel like it should be like like a spinover, like I'm some sort of like TV anchor. So if you have been watching, we tried this new format where we have news of the world, kind of, which we try to tie into witchcraft or the occult or magic in some level. And then Brian will be doing the occult demonstration, which is like a little minute or two where we show something magical, like something instructive. But today, the news. So... The first thing I wanted to talk about that I thought was really cool that's going on right now is the Art Institute of Chicago is doing a huge exhibition of the work of uh, Remedios Varo. She was a Mexican painter. She's born in Spain, but she ended up in Mexico. V-A-R-R-O? V-A-R-O. Varo, okay. Yeah, Varo. Okay, I don't know. Uh, Remedios Varo. She is an occult painter on some level. She was deeply influenced by theosophy, tarot, uh, Gurdjieff, and Mm -hmm, Uspensky, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, whole movement. mm -hmm. So it's deeply involved in that, but she's a fantastic surrealist painter. I actually um, have a book of her work that was a retrospective done recently, and it's deeply ingrained in like hermetic esoteric traditions, um, draws heavily from the Marseille tarot, from witchcraft, folklore, uh, both in Spain and Mexico, and her time in France. But they're doing a huge sort of um, exhibition of her work at the Art Institute of Chicago. So if you're interested in occult art, uh, you definitely should check out Remedios Varo. She's incredible. Um, I've loved her for a very long time. Okay, paintings, and drawings, what kind of a- actual work? Paintings painting. on canvas. Painting, okay. and she was and wrote short stories and a couple other things. She was very creative, but she's very known for her um, her surrealist occult. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can't wait. Paintings. I can't wait to look at that show. And um, something that I found out doing the research for this news that I thought was super cool is she wrote letters and had a private correspondence with Gerald Gardner. <gasps> And uh, which was not known during her life until later. And that part of their conversation was whether or not she was a witch or not by nature because she had shared some of her work with Gerald Gardner and he thought that it showed that she had innate witchcraft. I right? love that. I can't uh, wait to read so you, about yeah, that. Yeah, she wrote letters back and forth with Gerald Gardner, which I thought was super cool. Um, in religious news this, uh, this week, you've probably seen it if you've been following um, any major news outlet, is the French courts upheld the ban on the wearing of abayas in schools and hmm. public buildings hmm. in France. Wow. So there is a very fraught conversation going on right now in France regarding religious freedom, which is something we've brought up in our right. occult news of the minute things before. Right. Um, but as of right now, the French, the high court in France has upheld the ban. So the n- no wearing of the full face covering in public spaces like schools. So I had um, 
a new book release, uh, recently released, Byron Ballard, who's taught at Hex Fest mm-hmm. before. We really mm-hmm. like her. Just mm-hmm. has a new book out, Small Magics. Yep. Um, about uh, Appalachian witchcraft and how she sees that. And the second new release that I brought out is uh, very recently, about two weeks ago, they just did a re-release of Gerald Gardner's novel, High Magic's A. I didn't know that. Yes. I'm excited. Uh, through Dark Dragon Publishing, and the foreword is written by Philip Heselton. Oh, great. Yep. Great. Who, if you are somebody who reads in the occult world or whatever, you might have seen his books, which are biographies of some of the founders mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. traditional witchcraft, uh, such as his book, Doreen Valiente Witch. And his books mm-hmm, on Gerald mm-hmm, Gardner. Mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. wrote a two-part uh, biography of Gerald mm-hmm, Gardner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's very well known in the witchcraft community. And he wrote the foreword. Yep. So they're re-releasing High Magic's Aid. I'm mm-hmm. excited. I went all the way to Atlantis Books in London to buy High Magic's Aid in the 90s when you couldn't get it here. Yeah. It was a small print book, too. Yeah. It's went through a couple of, uh, of versions. At the time. But, uh, at the time. Um, I, I got the new one that came out, and I can tell you it's um, the most... Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it sounded weird for a second. <laughs> I got the, the the new edition that he has is more like the original one that I had. Because um, I had a copy of it at one point in time that just went missing. And I was able to get a couple other copies, but it was missing contents in the back of the book that he has he has in there as well. Mm-hmm. So it's it looks very similar to the first edition. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah and uh, Heselton's cool. I have a couple of his books and I enjoy his biography. Well, he's a thorough researcher. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I say his sentences have 700 words in them, but I think he's <laughs> a very thorough researcher in, in his way in England, and he does know his way around the back roads of England. And he knows his way around craft. Mm-hmm. You know, he's very plugged in with a lot of very... Um, quintessential people in the foundations of both Gardnerian mm-hmm. and Alexandrian mm-hmm. witchcraft. Mm-hmm. So a good voice for it, for sure. Um, something that's been going on on social media, I don't know if any of you have seen this. I just saw his notes. I've um, seen it. Is the Cleveland Pagan Pride issue. So Cleveland Pagan Pride had this issue of a Christian missionary group holding up a sign that said free supernatural hugs. Oh, yeah. And it was a deeply, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, secretive... Uh, missionary event where they were lo- kind of lying about being there um, on good terms or you know it was all false pretenses hugs from Jesus uh, it, it was like it was there was like a script and a whole training mm-hmm, that these people mm-hmm, went through to sort of like mm-hmm. bring pagans and witches back to Christ once you were in their arms they whispered yes. it in your ear so it exploded on social media a lot mm-hmm. of people naming and shaming and sort of bringing up this group and all of the Facebook posts that they had shared um, or surrounding Cleveland pagan pride but yeah so keep a watch out for rampant Christian missionaries. The last thing I have on the list uh, is I'm sure you have noticed the absolute just cluster F that has been Burning Man uh, this wow. year. <laughs> wow. Um, Burning Man, for those who don't know, is a festival in the American Southwest, heavily associated with counterculture, or it used to be, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it flooded this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and the pictures, wow. It was insane. Knee deep mud. And, uh, Burning Man is actually a very fascinating topic right now because Burning Man used to be heavily associated with countercultural movements, including like neo-pagan yes, groups and right. radical fairies and all kinds of other things that are associated with witchcraft, magic, paganism. Mm-hmm. It is now has a pretty negative reputation of sort of being inundated by like Silicon Valley tech bros who are just like looking for a hedonistic right, weekend. Right, right. So there have been multiple opinion pieces that have come out in major publications the last couple of weeks. Um, one of them, I think it was CNN, did an opinion piece about uh, be careful about laughing at Burning Man because it's really about climate change and it's coming for us all, right? Oh, wow. You know, the idea that this desert flooded sure, 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 sure. in the midst of, uh, you know, something that's never happened in the history of the festival. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then all these other opinion pieces about the commercialization of counterculture, which is something we have talked a lot about on Covendom. Right. The idea that we now deal with uh, witch talk and, you know, mm-hmm, the proliferation mm-hmm, of witchcraft mm-hmm. and the occult on mm-hmm, social media. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Big changes coming, right? Big changes. Love it or hate it. I don't know if you guys have thought about this because we all live in New Orleans, and so we're quite accustomed to the, the yearly threat of hurricanes mm-hmm. and you know uh, high amounts of rain. But we have an advantage to some coastal cities because we already have pumps, even though right. three of them never work. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> yes. We we have them. the entire time I've lived there. There's always been um, there's always been a Pump newscast yeah, every right. time that three of our pumps right. are out since right. Katrina and they've right. never been yeah. fixed. But anyway, um, these storms are happening more and more and people in areas that are not used to it 
are really in danger because they don't have the infrastructure. So for the first time ever, I almost feel a little safer in New Orleans with weather events than I do. Like, for instance, if a hurricane hits Salem, I don't even know. You're on high ground, though. Your house isn't going to flood. You would just have wind damage. And well, we're right by the ocean, so you, it could you flood, are, actually. You are. You'll yeah. have to find you out. got a tsunami, it would come up here. Your sea level. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. Like that. But yeah, um, those were my major news points. Check out Remedios Varro. Be careful about laughing about Burning Man. And check out Byron Ballard's new book, Small Magics, as well as the new edition of High Magic's Aid with the forward by Philip Hesselton. Lovely. Beautiful. So, Levi, without giving too much away, is this artist the same one that you are you have given us a picture of? No, no. Remedios oh, okay. is, uh, she's, she died in 1964. She's, uh, okay. yeah, but she's, uh, she's really incredible. I mean, it's surrealist, so you have to like surrealist art. It's very I'm, like, bizarre. I'm, I know I'll recognize it when I see it. You will. It, it's very similar to somebody I bet you know. It's very similar to Le- Leonora Carrington. Mm-hmm. Leonora mm-hmm, Carrington. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's like mm-hmm. that. So now we're going to go to Brian with the occult demonstration. All right. So my occult minute or whatever of the week is going to be a bit bizarre because uh, thanks to Ellie, I was reminded I have it. And I thought, well, you know, what am I up to right now? I've had a couple ideas filed away for when this happens. So I actually was up to something. So it's kind of a show and tell, but I want to give you um, the premise for it. So, you know, one of the things I think people forget about and we're sort of guilty of it in New Orleans because we live in a swamp, is that a lot of witchcraft is worked outside, you know. And in the Alexandrian tradition, we're very fond of our temples, but, you know, from the very foundation of our tradition, we worked outside on Alderley Edge, and, you know, you've all seen them creeping around caves and things like that. So, unfortunately, in New Orleans, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, we, We still make attempts but it is a swamp it, the environment is not hospitable and it's really hot all the time right. and when it's not really hot it's really cold um so it's very hard to really find a, an outside working spot so since i've been working with the salem coven i have a better opportunity to do that again because in my my younger days working outside was almost a constant so i was thinking about you know I, i'm a little more experienced now when we were in our teens and 20s we just ran out into the woods you know might carry a sword we didn't care you know um but discretion is sort of important so i really wouldn't want to go to a possible place where i could have public people find me or the cops get called or something like that and have things like a sword or have any of our sacred secret tools Mm -hmm. that we would Mm -hmm. want people to see So I've begun creating an alternative set of things to bring to outside workings. We've only had one. We're about to have another. And so I just want to share you this. I don't want you to think that the caliber of this equipment reflects what I really use in my coven, because I can assure you that it does not. Um, In the Alexandria tradition, we like things to be beautiful, and we're all very fond of very beautiful, intricate tools. These are not those. But any witch worth their salt can cast a circle with their finger. So I've just been thinking about, and I'm still developing this, so it could change, but I thought I'd share it with those of you who might want to work outside, whether it's alone or with a group, and this is more for a group. Um, The first time we worked outside, we went with very minimal stuff, so I'm going to bring more this time. So it's all about discretion, right? Because the last thing you want is for people to see your group. You know, if you're all in hooded robes carrying a sword, the curious may follow, you know, and that's the last thing you want. So the first thing I would um, recommend is be very cautious until you find working spots outside that you know are safe. Safe legally, safe from partying people, safe from the public wandering in. Um, and then I, if you have a big group, I would suggest that you meet uh, separately, that you don't all go in together at the same time, you break up into teams, basically. But one of the things that um, I'm going to share with you, and I don't know how well it will work here, is how to transport your equipment. So picnic basket, right? Sorry, can't tell what the camera is. It's great. This is a small, small picnic yeah. basket. And um, I actually had to get two because we're Alexandrians and we need to carry the wine in. So one is really for wine. <laughs> this is the wine bag mostly. Beautiful. Um, but they're both picnic baskets. Patty. And you could go as far as you want with this. Like I said, it's experimental. So a couple people going into the woods with a picnic basket or a backpack doesn't look odd. 
right? It just looks like they're going to go have a picnic. So one of the things I liked about this, and you can get it on Amazon.com, both of them, is at the top of it could be used to turn the whole thing into a mini altar. If you can't find um, rock, a suitable rock or something, mm -hmm. you could, and I've got cloths in there, turn this in. That's not what I'm planning on doing because I have an alternative, but it's there. Mm -hmm. God, now I, don't know how to, now I don't know how to shut it down. Um, <laughs> So I, I did that earlier too. Um, so inside, you know, you get there, you arrive to your spot. So we'll have one with the wine in it. <laughs> of course. Gonna... <laughs> we'll have the, the yeah. one dedicated solely to wine. So solely to wine. We only usually bring our couple of bottles when we're working outside because somebody has to drive and we will usually go to a pub or something afterwards. So we make it a little bit more fun. But so I've got stuff I'd never use in, in a regular. So I've got something for... And I don't know what I'll use and what I won't. The group will figure that out. Because when you work outside, a lot of times you try to work with what's in nature. You know, if you need a wand in your ritual, you pick up a stick. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. if you need water, you go to a stream, if there is a stream. You know, if you don't have a stream there, you need to bring water or whatever it is you need. You know, without giving too much away, obviously. Um, candles, that sort of thing. If you're going to do anything fire, be very careful and make sure it's put out and realize it's probably illegal. Um, right now. So cloth, right? So we are very minimal in how much flame we'll use because we, we want to be discreet, but very simple pentacle. It's not really an Alexandrian pentacle. So if, if, I, if somebody does interfere or if cops were called or something like that, they're not going to see anything, but it'll serve its purpose. Right. Um, and here I have candles and some other things I'm not going to show you. <laughs> um, this was my favorite thing. I think Levi will love this. So. Um, I, I would never use this on my real altar, but I thought outside it was great. So it's just a little goddess. Oh, I, do love I love that. I do. And, you know, you could put, a, it's got a little stand. This is also all from, all of this is from Amazon and it was very cheap. So none of this was very expensive. Oh, look at that. I just, you know, so she could sit on any kind of altar or rock. So you have an image. It's really easy to They're discard. My favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I love those paleolithic images. Mm -hmm. You know, little bowls for for whatever you're going to use the little bowls for, because mm -hmm. I'm not saying too much. Um, and then I've got to do a plug. So just in case some witch needs to do a spell and I didn't know, you know, got to be prepared with all the little hex kits. Yes, of course. <laughs> so we've got the little hex Available. kits. So we've got some hex, stuff with us. Hex and um, Like these two, the, like all three of the people on here could tell you that we wouldn't really use these in our temple rituals. No. But, um, you know, an incense burner or whatever you want to use it for. Mm -hmm. So the point is, is these are all little teeny things. And of course, there's lots of things I won't be bringing. And you just have to realize, you know, anything you can find in nature, um, you don't need to bring. Yeah. Right. And you don't need a sword. But, you know, <laughs> I suppose if you want to get a really big stick, you can. Um, and then the other one is like the wine thing. And so if you preferred something like this, this also has a table thing that folds out. Mm -hmm. But I actually um, am putting the wine in here, but it has a holder for a chalice, which I can't get out. And then very small little altar. Perfect. Oh, so sweet. Which could go on a rock or something. Now, it's not really my taste. You know? It's lovely. And it says, it's lovely. It says w Wiccan House on the back, or Wicca House on the back, which disturbs my innermost being. But it's, <laughs> you know, if you put a cloth over it, it's really it's suitable a nice for solid, It's a nice solid wood altar, Brian. It looks great. If you're working alone, a backpack will do, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't have to have a lot of stuff. And depending on what tradition and who you're working with and why you're working, you can alter it. But... I think it's a smart idea if you're going to work outside to come up with an alternative way that you can express yourself without causing too many problems. Also, in a pinch, this could all be thrown very quickly back into the picnic basket. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a lot of Car. stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not not anything you couldn't get rid of very quickly. Um, I have been in situations in craft throughout the years where we did have authorities called on us to where some of the old tricks were very useful. That's why witches often wore black, uh, was so that they could disappear into the darkness. Because if you were meeting outside, it'd be too dangerous to meet in groups of people at someone's houses when it was, you know, in the mythological illegal right. times. Right. The, the mythological illegal times. But even if you were doing a, an occult gathering, you wouldn't mm -hmm. have wanted to have, nope. you had a bunch of people rolling up to your house that would have been suspicious. Suspicious. Yeah. 
So they would go into the woods um, where most human beings are not going to be walking around at night. And they wore black because you could disappear very easily. Mm -hmm. And we actually used that old trick to get away from a large group of authorities that were looking for us, probably thinking we were doing something nefarious, which we weren't. But we still didn't want to be caught. Unfortunately, in that story, I, I did lose a ritual dagger, which is why I'm very careful nowadays. And also, if you had stuff on it, like... Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to bring your book of shadows. Mm -mm, that would no, be right. that would be a big no no because first of all, you don't need it. You should somebody should know how to work without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if, if you got caught by the police, they could confiscate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, or anything really. Mm -hmm. So we're very you know we're very you know careful about what we bring. I I will bring a knife, but you don't have to. You know, um, know your local laws and things like that. Fortunately, in Salem, there are a lot of religious protections towards witches, and witches are very well known here. So it's very unlikely we would have any problems with the authorities. Uh, but if you're you know, burning fire where you shouldn't be or yeah. something like that, that's what you'll get busted for. Or drinking, right, right, you know, right. we we'd get busted for the wine, really, probably. Right. No, no, that's um, the thing about Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Open not in New Orleans, Orleans, but here in yeah. Salem. But anyway, that's what I want to share with you. Portable Thank altars. You. Go, go outside. Worship the mother of the earth outside as often as you can. It's good for the soul. And it's so exciting to see you unpack the basket. <laughs> I know. It's like it was like you did. You were really selling this whole HGTV. Before I know. Witches. I just love to see what it. was next. It um, was like Christmas. I thought it was going to be a bit weird, but before, there we go. Before you introduce Christine and we bring her on, just real quick, I want to say we see all of your wonderful comments through <laughs> Facebook, through YouTube. We get all of them through Restream. Wow. If um, any of you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And after the ambush interview, we will get to them, I promise. And uh, we have, um, I see all of the wonderful initiates, Tracy and, uh, you know, um, Anne, blessed be. Um, I'm so glad to see all of you here. And Fiona, it's so good to see you here as well. Uh, but yes, we see all of your lovely comments. I'm so happy you've joined us this evening. But Miss L.A., do you want to introduce our wonderful guest? And I'll bring her on. So excited to introduce Christine Stevens, who is a founder of the New Orleans Coven, along with Carrie Ewers and Brian Kane. You know, back in the 40s or something like that, right after World War II, they got cranked up, right? <laughs> um, they're all 89 now, 93. No, I'm kidding. But founding a member of the New Orleans Coven, Christine is a flying around the world, very high profile executive. It's hard for us to keep up with her at this point. She's always in a different location, and she's always on vacation in between the places she's working. So we love that. And she's gonna, home tonight. We're going to pop her on, and I'm going to unmute Miss Christine. Blessed be, Christine. Blessed how are be, you? Blessed be, Christine. Blessed how are you? Be. Tell us how we Thank can... You for the Thank you for the wonderful Thank you. I'm sorry? Tell us how, you can, how we can find you. How can we keep up with you in the witchcraft world? How can we see what you're Oh, thinking? my goodness. Well, as you've seen, Facebook is probably the easiest way. I'm mm -hmm. a very public witch. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anything that I'm doing, anything I'm attending, anything I'm presenting at, you're going to find it on my Facebook page. And I have my picture mm -hmm. there. So it's mm -hmm. very easy to know that you have the right Christine Stevens. And it says right on there, Alexandrian initiate and witch. So most definitely you can find me there. Just coming off Hexfest, it was really exciting. It was so wonderful to see everybody. Um, and coming up, I'm going to be a special emissary at right. Endless Night in New Orleans. Yes. That's mm -hmm. going to be a really fun mm -hmm. thing. And I just heard that I'm invited back for Hexfest for next year. So Yay. very, very excited about that. Yes. Wonderful. In between, I'm really excited. I'm hoping to do a couple of new workshops. So I'm kind of, you know, polling people and finding out what makes sense. Um, unlike Levi, I haven't been able to start a coven up here, as some of you may already know. I've relocated to the Midwest. I'm in Ohio. Now I've got the perfect spot to work outside. I've got an acre of backyard and it's got tons of trees and I can pick up a stick or use rainwater and I have all the things. Unfortunately, I have zero time to do any of these things because I'm always on a plane going somewhere or coming back from somewhere. Oh, but the minute that that changes, all the time. <laughs> yes, you'll get there. You'll get there. The right people will find you and fall in love with you. You know, Brian and, and, Maxine and so many other people have said, when the seeker is ready, the teacher will appear. I think that there's a new twist on this, and it's when the teacher is ready, the, the seekers will appear. I agree. Just to let you know, Christine, you are getting lots of lovely, beautiful shout-outs in the comments from people who have attended your workshops at Hexfest and enjoyed them immensely. 
And Christian Absolutely. Day, it's not her backdrop. It's her real house. I already that's know my that. Office. And she's yes, like, Christian. oh, this is my home. Yeah. Talking this about how fabulous her backdrop yes, is. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. So, so I've been in this room since 630 this morning. I know. What? I'm, I'm dying <laughs> yes. to know. I'm dying to know. What is the subject of this ambush yes. interview, Christine? Oh, you know what? Well, first of all, my phones went to sleep because, of course, it did. But you're going to like this because we are smack in the dab middle of the Virgo season, right? Yep. Yep. And you gave me the perfect segue because this is how I came up with this topic. Um, I live in Ohio, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, Cleveland Pagan Pride. I was one of those people who was absolutely sharing this with the local groups going, are you aware of this? Do you know that this is happening? Because this is really, at least from my perspective, unethical. Mm -hmm. This is people doing things under false pretenses. Mm -hmm. And I went, what a great topic. We are doing ethics in witchcraft. Oof. Ooh. That's a good topic. I love that topic. That's big. That's big. So I've put together seven questions as requested. Nobody's seen them. Okay. I'll go through them. And if it's okay with you, can I call on one person to start and then you can figure out who goes next? Sure. Okay. No, you time. control it control it the whole time. Just make sure we all get to want, answer each question. Absolutely. Okay. So the first question. And we'll start with Ellie. How do you define your ethical boundaries in your magical practice? And what principles or criteria do you use to evaluate the morality of a spell or magical action that you're going to perform? Okay. Thank you for that beautiful question. I was thinking about this recently in a conversation with someone in the shop. My upbringing was very strong with a few basic rules we i've said it before no lying no cheating no stealing but there was always the motto of what my parents and grandparents said do the right thing or do right choose correctly which for them would mean not harming and not manipulating and not interfering so my general heart in my deep heart i feel that i'm compassionate and kind And I usually feel sadness or sorriness when someone else is behaving poorly or causing harm. I do. And my general go-to is to try to do healing and helping of any situation that's sour or bad or any person that ends up being sour or bad. So how do I decide? And, And this was the conversation I had. Someone wanted to do some hexing magic and i said well you've really got to make a list then of what you think are possible outcomes this could really go haywire and if you're talking about doing if you're wishing negative painful destructive things to happen you've got to be able to take responsibility for them at some point bouncing back around in your world so i'm kind of a chicken and my basic rule is just be nice do good say in the south we say bless their heart bless their heart but i did in that story to that person i said well i rarely hex or curse somebody but when i do they know it and everybody else does too so i know i can if i have to that's my answer fair okay right one of the things that i often um say to people is I think it's very important we don't separate our ethics from our magical ethics. Like these are not two separate things, ethics or ethics, right? I definitely believe that, um, you know, with power comes responsibility. But it doesn't matter to me whether you're going to curse someone to die or whether you intend to go shoot them with a gun. It's the same thing. You know, hiding behind a black candle doesn't mean you don't have the mindset of a serial killer. You know, just because you're not very good at it or whatever doesn't mean that you're you know not having that same mind frame. So obviously, in witchcraft, we do have ethics. You know, we have we have things like the witch's creed, sometimes called the Wiccan reed, to my demise. And it harm none, do what you will, you know. And people scoff at such things like this in the Golden Rule. And I think, you know, what's wrong with this rule? I don't think I want to know somebody who wouldn't follow that rule in any walk of life. Yeah. Because the rule is saying, do your thing, just don't hurt people. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you should be able to get whatever you want without hurting people. Mm-hmm. I don't really think it's complicated. I don't think that's Fluffy Bunny. I think that's walking with 
integrity and wisdom. And I think it's a great read, you know, so just like I think the golden rule is a great rule, you know, so I think, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. These are all religious sayings that basically say the same thing. So if someone's toxic in magic, they're a toxic poisonous person, period. So I think your ethics should should be one and the same. So I measure everything I do in life, whether it's magical or mundane with the same standard, you know, and I do try to live a life where I get what I want without causing harm. And I do try to have a life where harm is minimized, you know, obviously in nature, it's not entirely possible. You know, the big animal kills the little animal, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it's not done out of cruelty. It's done out of survival. So when I'm eating my hamburger, I'm just hungry and enjoying the, the the death of the poor cow. You know, I didn't really wish the cow harm. I just, it's not my fault. It tastes good. You know, so <laughs> there are, you know, there are lots of debates about all this sort mm-hmm, of thing, mm-hmm. but whether we should eat animals, whether we should hunt, you know, whether we should defend ourselves, whether we should be yeah. completely... Um, you know, uh, anti-war. And these are philosophical debates worthy of conversation. But I think in nature itself, we innately know some things are wrong, you know, mm-hmm. and animals mm-hmm. animals don't lie, you know, not unless it's a hunting tactic. You know, it's, it's definitely within sentient life forms to sort of know certain things, you know, and human beings in particular, there is a reason why every culture in the world has certain values, despite their religious differences Mm -hmm. that are shared, you know, that love is sacred, that family is sacred, that there might be certain animals that you shouldn't eat, and you shouldn't eat each other. You know, there's things like this that, you know, are very common uh, as we develop as societies. So I think same with Ellie. Um, no harm, no stealing, lying, um, that sort of thing. It all goes together in the same nature Mm -hmm. of a person. I don't know someone who's not a liar who doesn't also steal or hasn't stolen. Like those two things seem to always go together, you know, that kind of treacherous Mm -hmm. behavior. So, um, yeah, just whether the person's toxic or not and whether you're toxic or not, don't be toxic. Blessed be. Yes, (laughs) blessed be. So um, this is really tricky because ethics are an enormous field in philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moral Mm -hmm. philosophy, ethical philosophy, it's a huge Mm -hmm. field. I will, I'm going to say up front a huge caveat. I am less well read in contemporary ethical philosophy than I am other areas of philosophy. There are ethical philosophers I deeply love, Mm -hmm. but but it is very fraught, right? It's a very, very fraught uh, subject. I will say I'm very different, I think, than a lot of people a lot of my co-religionists that I meet in the sense that I am very much not what is called a consequentialist in philosophy, which is the idea that ethical actions are only ethical or unethical based on their consequences. So like, for example, you you can make an argument that like the ends justify the means or whatever. I am um, much more into what's called virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. If you want to research more about that, a big popular name in that and in contemporary philosophy is Alistair McIntyre. He's a Roman Catholic. Uh, but I, I believe, basically, actions and are moral in a cosmic transcendent mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. And we discover that. We don't invent it. So I do not believe that ethical choices are consequentially determined. I do not believe that the ends justify the means ever. Um, I think that actions are simply what they are. And this is where it gets a little wonky. I would say that my sense of ethics, Christine, is deeply religious in the sense that I believe that God... You know, you know, God right. is what she is. Right. And part of what she is, is goodness itself. You know, a lot of Americans in particular are really infected by Protestant Christian thinking, which uses a sort of what's called divine command theory, which is an action is good or evil because God said so. Right. But deeper philosophies in Christian tradition argue that it's not that. God is goodness itself. Right. So when you are acting in an ethical way, you are one with the gods. You know, a lot of Greek thinkers thought this way, like pagan Neoplatonist philosophers like Mm -hmm. Plotinus Mm -hmm. and people that are really important. Plato himself. Plato himself, yes. Like when you do a good act, you are one with God. You are one with the gods. And God's revelation to us through our morality, I believe, is absolute. So I don't actually believe in gray areas. 
Now, that's not to say I don't fail frequently, but if you're asking me, like, where do I think ethics lie? I think they lie, as Brian said, as an innate part of the <laughs> human conscience that I would happily say is the voice of the goddess, or I would call it the soul. Um, you know, I would be completely comfortable with that. And I want to address one quick thing. Craig said Kant rides again. Um, I am sounding a lot like Immanuel Kant. I'm not a Kantian for lots of reasons. Uh, Deontology is not really my gig. If you're into that and you're watching the show, I much prefer virtue ethics, but you're right. I'm, I understand why you would think it would be. Um, I sound like Kant, but um, you're separating yourself from situational and circumstantial ethics, which, correct. which respond to what other people do. And, and you're saying, no, yes. there's an ultimate v rule set that you believe but it's, I don't fully like participates. Rule. Well, I, I know that's like not a, right. Maybe Dharma is a better okay. word. It's the law. But embedded in right? reality, embedded in the goddess. It's embedded in reality, exactly. It's not, but I think that the big problem a lot of people have with the way I'm talking about this is ego. A lot of people don't ever want to feel bad. They just want to justify. And maybe it's the old Catholic in me. I don't want to feel me. bad. I want to feel good. Yes. <laughs> but maybe it's the old Catholic in me. But uh, I'm fine with admitting when I fail because I learn from my failures. And I think that's the mark of an initiate. Like you learn from your fails, you grow and you climb the mountain. But a lot of people I run into who are consequentialists are like, no, there's always a reason. It's situational. You don't understand. It's not my fault. I had to do what I had to do. It's a lot of excuses. And... Um, I think the the path of initiation is a little bit more brutal than that. Yeah, so like I'm a little that. bit more. I just I just have to say that um, we all have known for quite some time that Levi's a cult, but I don't think it's very nice <laughs> to <be> say. <laughs> a very different pronunciation. Right, right. a Kantian. <laughs> Okay, and with that... Sorry, I couldn't help myself. What a big answer we all got. That was so brilliant. What a great... Christine, yes. you're killing it with this. Like, in, right. like We immediately were in the heavy stuff. I loved it. Not a problem. Hold on one second. Phew. Being a Virgo and Mercury Retro is no joke oh, because my questions right. disappeared. Right. But now they're back. Okay, I'm breathing again. Okay, this is a good one. We're going to start with Brian this time. Brian, when it comes to spell casting or magical rituals, what level of consent should be obtained from all parties involved? And how can practitioners ensure they're acting ethically in this regard? Consent. Wow. Well. It's very, um, I think it's very confused. Because so I'll say, I speak from, from my perspective as an Alexandrian or initiate initiated witch, which nothing in our tradition actually requires consent. However, um, it's sort of considered very taboo to work magics on a brother and sister of the craft without consent. You know, for instance, a very good example would be healing. You know, um, if you get involved in a healing work, you don't know enough about the information or you don't know that somebody else might be working in a different way, the idea is that you could, you know, muddy it up. Or what if you're working on healing someone who doesn't want the healing? Like, for instance, let's decide, let's say somebody's um, got stage four cancer and they've accepted their fate and they're going to die, but we all go work to heal them and it prolongs their life mm -hmm. for nine more months. Mm -hmm. And there's just suffering, you know. So in some senses, that is the case. But because witchcraft is a secret um, a secret society, and because many witches are secretive, they couldn't obtain consent from a lot of people that they wish to work with. However, if you're talking about someone who doesn't work magic, consent really wouldn't be relative um, to the conversation. I would advise that you know the situation or at least work in a way that uh, keeps things free and open. You know, I hate to use the the sort of idea, you know, give it give it to the goddess or give it, give it up to God because I think that we are more direct, directly involved in that when working on magic. But if I've got a neighbor who I know they're having a hard time paying their rent and they're, let's say, a Christian muggle who doesn't even know I'm a witch and I do a spell to help them pay their rent, I don't think anyone's going to really scoff at how or why. You know, I might tell them that I prayed for them. You know, um, I prayed to Jesus for you, you know, whatever. So, no, we're not required because we're allowed to be secretive. We don't have to tell people what we're doing. Yeah. In fact, we're encouraged not to. But if I was going to work healing for one of the three of you, I would ask you if you wanted me to, and I would discuss it with you, you know. And so usually among 
our fellows, we do obtain consent, but that's more of like a best practice than an actual rule. Nothing in our liturgy says that. It comes from other traditions. It comes from the New Age movement and it comes from modern Wiccan pagan publications that people think that that's actually a mode of operation and it's not. It's it's very much uh, something that's said though. Yeah. But that's what I have to say about it. Mm -hmm. Blessed be. Blessed be. Blessed be. Ellie? Wow, I thought of so many things while Brian was talking. I definitely feel in our tradition, in our group, we're going to discuss magic beforehand, and anyone who wasn't comfortable with it could choose not to participate in the group work. One of my own rules has always been someone needs to ask me to do some magic for them specifically, and I will, depending on you know what they ask me to do. I don't choose oh i think so and so needs something and i'll do it for them um yeah it's pretty cut and dry for me i think it's like I've, if it's me doing it i pretty much do what i need to and want to as long as i feel i'm i'm in alignment with whoever's i'm working for and mostly i work for myself yeah i do i'm done blessed be um, I think sometimes it can be a bit of a moot point uh, for me because I do not practice painful magic. I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mm -hmm. not going to go into some big rant mm -hmm. about what I believe about that. I'm just going to simply say I don't practice painful magic. So um, I kind of agree with Brian. I'm pr if I'm working for another person, it's only going to be for something positive. Personally, that's the way I work. So I would no more ask for their consent than I would to leave an envelope of money in their in their mailbox. You know what I mean? Like you don't ask consent for that either. Mm -hmm, uh, when mm -hmm. it's an act of charity, you don't really mm -hmm. have to do that uh, mm -hmm. unless you're going to infringe upon their individual rights, which you, you're not going to do in those kind of situations. The one area where consent can get tricky that I do think is um, interesting is I had a very fraught conversation with my own coven recently where I had to put the kibosh on the use of contemporary psychological language um, in the circle, where people would start talking as if it was therapy. Ooh. And um, one of the things I said is, is even if we're a young religion, literally, we draw from an ancient worldview, right? From the worldviews of late antiquity, from the worldviews of um, lots of different time periods, but we do not have this modern obsession with hyper-individualistic liberty, and so, there are issues where I don't care about consent. Like, for example, you will never get to pick your initiator. Period. End of story. You will not know who it's going to be until it happens. I'm not going to ask you for permission because you came to me to be initiated. Right. So you're not going to get to pick your initiator. You're not going to get to know what the ritual is going to be like. You know, um, you're giving me consent by being the seeker to be initiated. So in areas like that, I do feel like sometimes, you know, that would make some people uncomfortable who have you know more modern values, and I I don't care in that situation. That would be the one instance where I would say, the religious experience is about surrender to the experience on some level. But when it comes to spell casting, again I don't I don't do baneful, so it's not really a huge issue for me. <laughs> Can I kill you with magic, please? I know, right? <laughs> please <laughs> check yes or no. <laughs> you're gonna yeah when you're gonna do some baneful magic i don't ever ask permission you're right about that the, yeah, the very few times i've done it i did not ask moved. permission yeah so this time we'll start with levi okay levi how do you approach the use of magical practices for personal gain versus for the greater good Oof. is there a balance to strike or is there certain situations where personal gain should be prioritized homegirl brought the stuff tonight like these questions are so much deeper um okay uh this is tricky because first of all there's nothing wrong with wanting um success you know we're not uh i mean we're witches we're not methodists you know um so you're, you're allowed to want things you know um i i have a, a very i'm very guilty sometimes of being a little overly i think spartan or a little overly um sort of anchorite like in my in my worldview and i can get away from that joy sometimes which is i'm 
why I'm so grateful to be a witch because May Day will come along and remind me. You know what I mean? Or like the summer solstice will come along and I'll be reminded of what it's like to be a king and like to be the king of my own castle and feel like a god and like, you know, to be one with the gods and dance in their presence. And like, I'm so um, glad for you, Levi. It, it is. That's what, <laughs> why I think, that's why I think um, the goddess made me a witch. But uh, it was to be like, we could not let you stay Catholic. It would have got real weird. But um, <laughs> it would have got real weird and real self destructive. So I think um, I think there's nothing wrong with uh, that. But I will say, in my mind, the mark of a powerful witch is someone who works for their own glory and realizes that their own glory is aided and put into excess by the glory of others as well. What is a weak witch is someone who believes that their glory can only be built up by stealing it from other people. Mm -hmm. Putting out Mm -hmm. other people's Mm -hmm. candles does not make yours burn brighter. You are working with the same fuel, right? So if you put theirs out, you have done nothing to illuminate your own. So I think, I think there is a certain sort of like almost Uber Mitch quality to that, to that ideology, which I don't always love, but I embrace, which is I want to be a God amongst other gods though that's the part everybody forgets i don't want to be a god over other people one of the things i think is the hallmark of that in contemporary initiatory craft is we don't have a laity every initiate is a priestess or a priest and so there's an equality in that that but an equality of great minds great souls seekers so i think ethically seek your own glory you know, in a, in a sea that rises all other boats, that raises all other boats, mm-hmm. I mean to say. Mm-hmm. Um, don't seek your glory by the subjugation of others because you will damage your soul in the process to the point that you will be weak. If you worship power in that way, you will end up always living in fear of losing power. Mm-hmm. So you're not really powerful, you're weak, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You're broken. So I think, uh, yeah, fight for your excess, fight for your glory, dance with the gods, but you're going to need other gods to dance with, right? I love that. Fabulous. I love the passion behind that answer. Blessed be. Blessed be. Brian. Will you rephrase the question for me one more time? The wine's kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. That's what you get for drinking with fairies. It's the mead. How yeah. Pro- exactly. How do you approach the use of magical practices for personal gain versus the greater good? And is there a balance or are there times where you absolutely should be working for and prioritizing magic for personal gain? Well, I do love the um, the old saying, God helps those who help themselves. You know, uh, I think, you know, what to what Levi's saying is if you're in a place to where you, you know, you've got a roof over your head, you've got food in your belly and enough to share with your neighbors and friends, you know, you're, you're more of an asset to humanity than if you didn't have anything. I mean, we all know I'm not very materialistic. But I will say that um, whatever I build up in my world, it it does get to a place to where you do start thinking of the bigger picture automatically. I think when we start out as babies, baby witches, as they like to say on Instagram, um, it's, oh, I want a boyfriend. Oh, I want a new job. Or I want this. You know, and you do. And I think part of it's because you want to see if the magic works and you're younger in life and so there's a lot of things you want you know I, i've known witches to work work for gucci bags you know and people need to practice so you know whatever they put in the witch did get the gucci bag um i definitely think that there are times to play and i think it's okay to play with magic but as you progress you know and as you if you if you enter into the service of priesthood your life goals tend to um magnify uh, bigger bigger things bigger than you so everything is about like what's the next staging area of the work that i'm doing you know so yes i mean i do like clothing and i like things like that but you know the people do expect me to look the part you know so in every essence of everything i'm doing however it is all going into the same thing uh, occasionally i do play but not like i did when i used to you know i don't i don't work for things um, like that anymore really you know i'm usually working for some sort of catalyst for change in our last episode we were talking a lot about divination and how we use our psychic minds and i was sort of reflecting on the fact that a lot of the psychic 
work that I do is revolving around my students. You've all heard me say I have my astral eye on you. Oh, God, yeah. Because <clears throat> my psychic abilities help me understand what you might need sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, sometimes. Um, so, yeah, magic's there for a tool to use, and it's, it's there for fun. It doesn't have to be serious all the time. But I think it's just a natural progression of life when your basic needs are met you start looking for bigger things. Yeah. If that makes sense. You start looking for other people's needs mm -hmm. or the needs of the tribe or or how to continue to, you know, propagate. You you want to use what you have in a better way. I don't think it's wrong to have money. I think it's wrong to I think it's wrong to have ten apples when everyone else in your tribe has one or none. And you keep all the tin apples, even if some of them are going to rot. Mm -hmm. You know, mag magically, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I do believe magic should be used in need, whether it's in your need or in the need of mankind or others. Hmm. I like that. If that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I love that. But when you're young, it's okay to see if you can get someone to fall off a chair. <laughs> we all have to start somewhere. Just don't do it later. Exactly. Oh, how cute. Okay, so I can start by saying I no longer do spells that allow me to have sex with the cute UPS man. But I do spells, Coming in hot. I know, right? I do <laughs> spells that say I do spells. Ali, that's when you do spells for other people to have sex with the cute UPS man. Well, I'm not there yet. I'm here I here's where I am now. I'm like kind of like, okay, Ellie, you're just really great in bed and adorable and fun and your sex life's fabulous. So I'm doing like magic like that. But I'm gonna seriously I wanna go back to Christine's first question in ethics. I think at this point in my life, the core of my belief is I'm here for service as a priestess. And a, and a healer and, and a helper for humanity. And I believe if I help humanity, I'm going to help the rest of the earth because I do think we're kind of the big power on the planet in, in terms of not Mother Earth, but, you know, who the creatures on it. I do really agree with Brian and Levi that you need to take care of yourself. And if you can't take care of yourself, and that includes whatever responsibilities you've chosen, household, children, a career, a mate, um, that you need to get that done. And you, if you can't do that, you need to do your magic around your own solidness and responsibility. And then I think, just like Brian's saying, naturally, you're solid. Your, your, your cup is full. The next thing to do is help the people around you, your neighbors, yeah. your family members, your coven. Um, and you want to. You know, as, as Neoplatonists and monotheists, we believe in the one. And that's really the truth. You know, if we hurt the whole thing, we, we hurt ourselves. If we help the one, we're helping ourselves. I think that all makes sense to us. And yep. so I function that way. And I don't mind doing magic for myself at any point. I have changed some of the magic I've done. I do now for to reflect my age. But um, I do really love the flow back out into the world. And that's always inspiring. And I think it's okay to do magic both ways, for myself and for others. Blessed be. Recipe. You're getting so many shout outs, Christine, in the comments for these questions. Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so they're so the deep. It is. They're so deep okay. and con con concentrated. Okay. Hold on to your hats, cats and kittens, because this one's going to be a buffy one. OK. <laughs> There's been a lot of digital debate around unethical cultural appropriation within magical practices. Mm -hmm. Can you share a bit about how maybe practitioners can respectfully engage with diverse traditions? Feel free to share cautionary tales, how, whatever, however you decide to do it. And this time, let's see, let's start with Brian. Well, I mean, I think um, cultural appropriation is something that, or the topic of cultural appropriation was something that was developed as a conversation many, many, many years ago. Uh, surrounding a completely different set of uh, wheelhouses. So it was really about that Hispanic woman sitting on the side of the road who was creating things out of her indigenous art. And then a major corporation was stepping in, stealing the patterns and mass marketing them, you know, and that's how this conversation got taken mm -hmm. or taken for mm -hmm. it. 
did not originally have anything to do with religious practices. And for the most part, it's only in the occult world that you hear this conversation. It's not really something the Catholics are talking about or the Buddhists. The Buddhists aren't running around saying only Asians can worship Buddha. You know, um, people I know who are indigenous uh, spiritually, they have more issues about their cultural art being, um, I, I grew up around a lot of Native Americans who I'm still friends with, and their issue was more of their cultural art. You know, they certainly would not have a, or did not appreciate the 90s white man shaman thing going on. Yeah. But that was just because it was so dumb and tacky. It wasn't like they were offended about their religious uh, spirituality. They just made fun of it. Um, so in one sense, I don't believe in spiritual appropriation, and here's why. I think that uh, coming from my own perspective, believing in reincarnation and believing that no one gets to define God for me or my religious practice for me. I don't believe any other human being gets to have uh, a word in how I approach the divine. If I see the goddess as a big black woman in the sky, then that's how I'm going to see the goddess and you can't stop me. You know, um, I find that most indigenous practices, when you get to the serious roots, don't have a problem with other uh, racial groups entering in as long as they do it appro appropriately, respectfully, and sincerely. In the Alexandrian tradition, probably because we are a, a religion that believes in reincarnation, our elders explored many, many cultures, some of which would be called dead cultures now, and some of which would not be. And people don't quite understand what that means. So, for instance, practicing elements of ancient Egyptian religion doesn't really have an impact on modern Egyptians today because they are not practicing that yeah. religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but likewise, it's not usually these people saying it. So funny enough, I'm wearing a kimono right now, you know, and um, I'm wearing a kimono that probably was created by, I don't know if it was created by Asians or white people. Most Asians don't care. They don't care. It's actually a part of, I want to say it's Japanese, yeah. but it might be Chinese it, culture, Japanese. that they actually, they love sharing, like they love to share their culture with people and people to do it. You know, no one thinks I'm walking around trying to be a samurai, you know. Um, so it's, it's just a beautiful piece of, I like <laughs> some of their fashion. You know, it's, it's not about me trying to take on the identity of, of an Asian culture. So I don't really care about it that much because I don't actively participate in anything that would be harmful. So the only, and I also think it goes into that conversation. This is a long winded answer for me because it is so important. I think when you get into a religious, um, any religious beliefs that you try to make racial, which really was not a practice of most of our ancestors. I'm not saying it didn't exist anywhere, but it really wasn't a practice. If you look at tribal societies, tribal societies would often adopt people in from other tribes or other races half the time because they kidnapped them but or married into them. They didn't care. You know, once you were a member of the tribe, you were a member of the tribe. Uh, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Celts, we all have historical records of most of these ancient cultures not really giving too, uh, too much about about that sort of thing. The gods were the gods and there were just different expressions for them. And that's what I believe today. So Alexander's was obsessed with the Aztec gods, you know, no one's worshiping uh, the Aztec gods the way that they did back then, thankfully. But, you know, it was an expression of the divine, you know, and that's how he chose to see it. I don't, but when I went to Mexico, I did pay attention to the local uh, wares and local spiritual things and I love exploring other cultures but I think when you get into that frame of uh, identifying God with a race you're walking very perilous to religious movements that are very toxic and evil and I don't think technically God has a race and I don't think that God is incapable of sharing itself with everyone and I think we're all plugged into it now, you know, and if you were reincarnated in other lives as something else, you might be drawn to it in this life and you don't have to explain it to anyone. So hopefully I answered that question, but in our belief system, from my point of view, we don't really follow that. And I think racially motivated spirituality or religion is dangerous. Bless me.
good answer. Thank you. Ellie? Sorry, it was long. <laughs> I love that. No, it's really well thought out. I um, will just say my two basic points of view, and also because I work publicly at Hex in the shop, and we have all people from around the world walking in to ask questions and look at books, and I want to be knowledgeable about the cultures and traditions and religions around the world in history and currently as much as I can keep up with it. And I don't mind pointing something out or showing a book or saying, hey, these are the people that you might want to read about if you like this, if you're interested in this path. But I definitely f feel strongly about not teaching or presenting myself as any kind of a priest person um, in any tradition other than what I'm initiated in. That, I mean, I even take that pretty seriously. Like, I think it's fine to say I'm studying and interested in certain paths and traditions, but for me... Uh, my initiation trumps everything, and I do feel strongly about being able to teach and conduct myself fully as a Alexandrian witch. Wow. So but but not, n nothing else, no other traditions, even though I might read about them or want to know about them so I could answer. Let me mute myself for a second. Sure. Okay, that's my answer. I don't have any ethic problems with appropriation. I think as long as people aren't teaching it or s stepping in as a priest or professional when they are not properly trained and initiated and accepted by the group or spiritual tradition. What do you think Agreed. about that, Levi? Blessed be. Blessed be. Levi? So um, this is tricky. This is real tricky. Mm -hmm. um, I think on a religious level, I think there's a couple things you have to think about. Number one... Many religions are missionary religions, like Christianity and Buddhism. They actively seek converts, they desire to grow their numbers, they spread their teachings. Some religions that are non-missionary religions are often at a severe disadvantage and are taken advantage of in that situation. Mm -hmm. You see this a lot in conflicts between Christian missionaries and Hindus in India. You see this in um, anti-Semitism and the forced conversion of Jews, uh, where Jewish people were not allowed to convert people under penalty of death in most of Christian Europe for a very long time. Um, so I think there are there are differences of power that need to be considered mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes I do think when it's like, well, anybody can believe anything. Yes, agreed. You, I agree 100% with Brian. You cannot tell me what God is going to show up like. She's going to show up how she shows up. But there's two areas where I do think it gets tricky. One of them is, like I said, power imbalance when you're dealing with a group that has historically been oppressed. And then all of a sudden a group comes in that has a lot of power. You know, for example... I think it is interesting, I might note, that when I was first interested in the occult and magic, voodoo was a dirty word, right? There was a lot of racism and a lot of really toxic mm -hmm. ideas around mm -hmm. Haitian voodoo, mm -hmm. around uh, West African religion, mm -hmm. around um, candomblé, santeria, mm -hmm. all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And now that there are an enormous amount of white authors talking about it, they're acceptable all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. I think that's problematic, Right? Where why was it not okay when, you know, it was it was a large it was largely done by people of color and now that we have white mouthpieces, it's socially acceptable. Um, and I think people don't do it maliciously, but a lot of times white converts to um, religions that historically have been linked to groups of people of color take up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they necessarily mean to, but it does happen, right? Where all you know, like you'll turn on your computer search some for something about an ATR and 16 out of the 20 re, you know returned searches mm -hmm, are white mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. when they are an infinitesimally small minority in the religion itself globally so i do think things like that can happen it can be very problematic the the final thing i'll say is is i really appreciate what ellie said the real danger is when you pretend to be an expert. I think one of the most tragic things that has happened in this vein has been what most americans think about tantra Oh, God, right. You know, uh, which is largely being pushed by white yoga teachers as something about sex Woody or, Harrelson. you know, your body alignment or whatever, when in fact it, it is nothing to do with that. Tantra is an enormously complicated subject in Dharmic religion. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I think. I think I agree with Brian. And, you know, you, it, on a religious level, it's not an ethical question. But on the practical level, I do think we have to consider things like power imbalances, authority, um, and space. That's what I would say. And money. So I wanted to, I don't normally do this, but this is a huge soapbox. So I wanted to just say one thing I forgot because I was so long-winded and I'll make it quick. 
So one of the things I've often contemplated with this subject is that we as initiatory witches, and we have to really tip our hat to the British witches for this because they're the ones who first encountered this, are an initiatory uh, lineage tradition that did not have any competition when it emerged in the UK. And we've had to examine, reflect, and watch a great deal of cultural appropriation going on towards our belief system. And as witches, we certainly can't be accused of holding the power. You know, today we have to deal with um, people saying that witchcraft could be Christian. You know, once again, goes to kind of what Levi's saying. So just like Tantra, I just want to point out to our listeners, the same thing has happened to witchcraft, where it's gotten watered down and misunderstood by the masses. Blessed be. Blessed be. Mm. Blessed be. Okay. I think we've touched on this, but this is going to be one we can dive a bit deeper into. The concept of, and it harm none, is often mentioned in magical ethics. How do you interpret this principle personally? And what steps can magical practitioners take to minimize unintended consequences or harm caused by their magical actions? Who, who do you want, Miss Christine? I'm thinking. I think this time we start with Ellie. Ellie. <laughs> Only Yes, only because she was going Levi, I went, nope. Well, let me think about it. Um, I think nature is harms. I think our perceptions, our emotional, physical body experience suffering. I think if you're on the earth, plants, animals, humans, you're going to experience some suffering. So I want to try to distinguish harm none from malicious or evil, you know, <laughs> desire to cause pain to something because you get pleasure from it versus, you know, like in a surgery, for instance, that you want to go really well for, for someone you're, you're doing healing magic for because they ask you, you know, the knife's still going to cut into their skin. Yeah. So I think I look at it a little bit scientifically that I'm, I, I may paraphrase the end of my spell work that says um, for the benefit of all, um, in alliance with the mind of the one or in alignment with the mind of the one, may, may it be excellent. And not really try to define no harming. I think that's pretty hard to get away from that all the way around. But I don't want to cause harm when it's not my business. That's what I think. don't want to cause harm when it's not my business. Hmm? Thank you. Blessed be Um, mm, I agree with what Brian said earlier, which is people love to to rag on this right now. Like, I don't live that Wiccan read. I don't, you know, care about those (laughs) Wiccan ethics. And it's like, (laughs) I mean, it's the golden rule. So, like, I mean, do you mock the golden rule from every spiritual tradition, from Rabbi Hillel and the Talmud, from the teachings of the Buddha, from, you know, I mean, like, I mean, maybe you do. Maybe, you know, a lot of occultists are really into being antinomian, sort of, um, almost the ideology of a psychopath. Um, I put a lot of the blame on Crowley. I know that's an unpopular thing to say, but I think he got into some weird Nietzschean ethics uh, in some of his writings that I find somewhat repugnant, to be honest. But um, I think he really did believe that he was God's chosen prophet and that therefore he could make up his own morality. Um, And I think that's what a lot of occultists believe in his vein, who, you know, sit around and do acid and think that makes them God. Um, I think... Oof, this is hard. Uh, Christine came with some real good questions. Um, so, and if harm none, do it you will. So, like, don't hurt anyone, but work your will, right? That's the that's the main point. I agree with Ellie, though. We obviously can't take that at face at value because, like, I mean, if you truly believed that, you wouldn't be able to get a lot done right, in life, breathe. right? You'd have to be a hermit, right. mm-hmm. you know. And even then, you wouldn't you wouldn't make you it. Couldn't that, eat. In my knowledge, the only major world religion who takes that to its extreme are the Jains. Jainism, in India, yeah, right? who like you know strain the water to get the microbes out of it, and who sweep the floor of the bugs, and who only eat mm-hmm. parts of the plant that won't kill the plant. So no tubers, no roots. Put like, cloth over their face so they don't breathe in any bacterial organisms. Yes, um, exactly. That, this sounds like a fun life. Jainism, no, it's it's, it's a in very, India. It's a very intense religion. It's in funny India. you can't be born into Jainism because celibacy is one of the tenets, right? So there's. Oh, no, they, no, 
Only amongst the monks. They have millions of, of members. And they have sex, and they have their own little Jane Yes, babies. only the monks live the life that, that we're talking about. Um, Doesn't right. having sex kill some of the sperm? Yes, yes. but um, we're talking about the life of their monks, oh, well, not of their, um, oh, of their lay right. people. The, the harm none, those are the ones that take yeah. it to the absolute So it's a, it's a principle across all Dharmic religions called ahimsa, nonviolence, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, taken to an extreme, and you know, or that sounds a little judgy, taken to a very harsh consequence in mm-hmm. Jainism. Mm-hmm. I don't... I think that it is still, the golden rule is still a way to simply capture a difficult to live out truth, which is trying to work one's will as a human, as a conscious being in this universe without cruelty and without malice. So I think it is a useful summary. Do I think there are going to be exceptions? Yes. Do I think that throwing the baby out with the bathwater entirely is sensible? No. Blessed be. I agree. Brian? I sort of already addressed this, so I'll just sort of quickly highlight a couple points. Um, one, um, witchcraft has a lot of ethics and a lot of rules for initiates. Um, we have oaths, we have things in our rituals that imply these things to us. The witch's creed was something that kind of got put out on purpose to the mass populace because it's something that seemingly anyone can understand as ethical because it is a lot like the golden rule but it does definitely have different ways of interpreting it you know and obviously you've got something about your will which is very magical and you've got something about not harming so you know if you're going to be a magical person and you're going to create in the world do it without harm that's the it wasn't a no it wasn't a don't hurt things things aren't going to get hurt kind of an idea it was a magical implication i also think it puts upon us personal responsibility which is something i think is unique to the craft that some religions don't have uh is that it's on you you know and it's advice it's good advice there's a lot of good advice in the craft bless it be i love that mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bless it be bless it be okay this time we're going to start with Levi. Okay. Levi, you are the perfect person for this question because <clears throat> it is great. How do you, I know you're going to be excited. How do you navigate the line between respecting the individual beliefs and challenging harmful or unethical magical practices within the community? Oh my God, girl. Ooh. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> like, oh. I wrote a whole chat the book that's coming out that uh, with Warlock Press. I, I have a whole chapter on um, red flags and groups, and the biggest red flag I have is paranoia, um, like which is sown by a lot of these groups. But uh, yeah, uh, I do not believe that um, everybody should do whatever they want all the time. I think this. I'm not a libertarian, so you know there, it's very it's very chic right now to say to be absolutely basically a nihilist postmodernist and to have no values. I mean, I have friends who literally have shared friends who are severe alcoholics or severe drug addicts and will say things to me like, but I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to get in their way. I mean, that's their life. That's their life. That's not ethics. That's cowardice, right? That's awful. You know, um, you know, not helping your fellow human beings is is just a sort of cop out, and yet it is rampant in my own generation. This sort of idea of like let everybody do whatever they want, even if they're destroying their life. It's like you can't offer advice, you can't say something is bad, everything is gray, there is no good and evil. It is just the bleakest way to live, and yet it is wildly popular in the magical community. Mm-hmm. I so I understand why you're asking, Christine, because it's everywhere. Um, no, I frequently, I mean, I am a priest. Right, you know, I I teach in a coven, so I do teach things that might seem judgmental. Like, for example, if you're obsessed with cursing everybody in your life and you're pissing in bottles every day of your week, every day of the week, because everybody's working against you, and you have to do protection magic 16 times a week because of all your enemies, you live a bad life. Mm -hmm. Like, you have bad values. You are you are you are probably dealing with something that borders on a pathological paranoia, Mm -hmm. and you probably are a combative and unpleasant person. Mm-hmm. And you nobody know. likes you. And Exactly. <laughs> and, like, frankly, <laughs> I think we have gotten into this just awful place of, mm-hmm. like, it doesn't matter what anyone does ever because nothing matters. And I'm sorry, but I'm, like, not willing to live in that, nihilis- in that nihilism. So, like, yeah, I teach that, like, if you are obsessed with curse work, I think that's a red flag to your mental health. I think it's a red flag to your morals. If you are obsessed 
with um, demons and Satanism and um, hurting yourself physically for your rituals and whatever, um, I probably think that's a red flag for your mental health and for your well-being. I think if you are, um, you know, it's just ridiculous. You know, I could go on, but I don't want to be tiresome and monotonous. I just want to say that, like, we should be able, as you know, if we're going to call ourselves teachers, to say, don't do this, right? Don't do this because, and we can give reasons. But no, I don't believe that everybody should be able to do whatever they want all the time. I'm just not, I'm not a libertarian. I'm not, I don't have that kind of worldview. That's a B. That's a B. Brian? Well, there's two pieces that I would bring out of this. Number one, I very much combat the term community. Um, I'm not a part of any community. You know, I interact with, um, I interact with sections of a perceived community. So Facebook does not make something a community. Um, pick out at the park doesn't make something a community. Barter fairs don't make something a community. A community has to have a lot of annual interaction. So that doesn't really exist in the bigger sense. I know why we call it that, but it's problematic. And here's why. You're taking different beliefs that by all accounts should conflict with each other. You know, there are uh, beliefs in voodoo that are absolutely contrary and not acceptable in initiatory witchcraft, vice versa. This doesn't mean I can't be friends with someone who's a voodoo priest or voodoo priestess or hugon or, or whatever, whatever titles we're using, and I am. You know, but I'm not in their voodoo community and they're not in my witchcraft community. I don't go into their their spheres and speak about how I think animal sacrifice is unnecessary, how I think it's profane in the eyes of the goddess, nor are they going to come into my circles and tell me that we should be doing it. <laughs> you know, so that's why they're different religions. You know, and I'm not speaking about which is better. You know, a Muslim is going to believe what a Muslim's going to believe, a Christian or a Catholic or anyone else. So the problem we have in the magical community is this idea that gets bigger and bigger and bigger that we're all together in this. And although there are some commonalities, there really are some major, major ethical divides, if that's what this topic is about. So I'll say I find that problematic. Um, and I, I don't change my beliefs based on someone else's. Mm -hmm. So if I think something's magically bad, mojo, it's because that's what I believe. Right. And your religion, your practice, or your navigation of it, even if your tradition says it's okay to set a goat on fire while it's still alive for magic, mine says that's evil. You know, and I believe it's evil. So I'm going to maintain that. I'm not going to give up my ethics for diversity, for culture or anything else. You know, quite frankly, I don't want to be friends with somebody who'd set a goat on fire while it's alive, regardless of the reason. And I don't want to work with an entity or deity that would accept it. So I don't really, I guess you could say it's not for trade. If am I answering this correctly? So I'm pretty vigilant in the fact that my beliefs, I don't push my beliefs on other people but I have them. And in my priesthood and in my covens, I'm very opinionated about those things. Bless it be. Hmm. Bless it be. Bless it be. Allie? I would take it to it myself first. My general attitude is how am I behaving? <laughs> look at my own manners. Look at my ideals that I ascribe to in my religion, my chosen religion, which is Alexandrian witchcraft. So I'm going to exemplify the behaviors I believe in, and I'm going to try to show that to others, and why I think that it makes sense, why I think it's a good way to behave. Just like Brian, I don't really go into other people's lives and try to change them or say that I don't like them or, or why I don't believe in something. But I do find myself cheerleading for young people or new people who are new to the occult worlds and who are gravitating towards kindness, harm none, compassion, understanding of the whole. You know, I go to those people on purpose and say, I see you're trying so hard to be good. I see you're thinking about your actions. I really commend you, and I'm proud of you, and I'm aware that you're working on your, on your own morality. 
whereas I might ignore people more than that I don't agree with. I would also probably still try to have good manners in public, but I'd be the one out there with the blanket trying to put that goat out, probably that they set on fire, and just say, oh, That's come poor on, goat. Little, poor little crippled burn-up coat, come with me and let me make a rescue center so I can take care of you forever and put you in a goat wheelchair. Um, that's just my own heart. You know, I just would save the goat. But I get where the line is about do we cross over and, and really try to change others. And Levi is saying we, we have specific rules we're going to follow. We're not going to bend and we're not going to mold fair, I'm, ourselves. I'm largely talking about our role as teachers. As like, teachers. Because the three of us teach yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. You know, and possibly in the future four of us. And Christine has taught in the past. Yes. So everybody on this call has had been in a position of responsibility over people's spiritual formation. So that's what I'm referencing. Like, I'm not going to go to the yeah. street corner yeah. and hold up a yeah. sign and, you know, the end of, the end is nigh. Uh, but yeah. that's what I mean. I, like de the, I definitely step in in our specific yeah. covens. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's the very small community. I kind of agree with Brian. These large communities, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm... I just think it's a fantasy, and I think it's a problematic fantasy because mm -hmm. it creates a mindset mm -hmm. where we're all supposed to be believing the same things. It's not... I don't think we do believe the same things, obviously. Really? Not possible. traditions, no. yeah. And Levi, I can totally see you on a street corner with a sign that says she's watching. She's I know, watching. right? She's coming for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> but it still goes back to Levi's idea that good is good. Good is good is the truth of, of the divine. Do you know what my parents, old Appalachians, say? They say, um, the truth will stand when the world's on fire. That's what my mother and father used to say all the time. The truth will stand when the world's on fire. Well, they're not wrong. Yeah. My Uber driver says, energy don't lie. Energy don't lie. <laughs> The like, yeah, that's driver. the same thing. I mean, yeah, they yeah they do. I got some interesting Uber drivers. I'm loving this. Oh, me too. What great questions. Okay, I'm done. Blessed be. <laughs> we do have time no, for another one. We have time for one more? Uh, maybe two. It'll depend. We usually do uh, stop at the 30-minute mark, so we'll see. Okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Um, because I have seven or more, but yes. Perfect. Most definitely. If we don't have callers um, or whatever, that's great. Next. Okay. Fantastic. So here is the next question. Um, given who we are, Alexandrians, what, in your opinion, are our responsibilities that we have towards the environment and nature? Mm. How can we make sure that what we're doing aligns with sustainability, respect for the natural world, and everything that goes along with that? And this time, I think we'll start with Brian, since you like to work outside. I'd like to say that um, I think everyone should have that responsibility. I think every human being on this planet is a custodian to this planet. I think God put us here as custodians. I think you can find it in the most ancient legends of many religions that she put us in a garden and said, these gifts are all for you, but you've got to tend it and take care of it, you know? And so I think, I wish everyone could do it, you know, as Alexandrian priesthood, I think what we can contribute from that angle is um, a reverence for nature. Goddess worshiping generally tends to be more holistic, more nature focused, more nurturing, caregiving. So putting this, consciousness into the social structure um, through initiates and new generations of children that the tree is holy that the animal is divine that we're all brothers and sisters on this biosphere and that we're not better than and that we all are supposed to be living in harmony um, i think that's something that we can do but i think every person on this planet is is really supposed to be doing that so Bless it be. Mm -hmm. Bless it be. Bless it be. Ellie. I love that. I'm an extra environmental witch, probably because I, as a, you, many of you know, I was raised in a kind of an organic house household with gardening and um, living living light in terms of not, of not wasting. So personally, I really love when when I see people recycling and walking and. Um, not throwing out their food or, or so much plastic and trying to be more a little bit more minimal in in how their their footprint impacts the earth and the world around them. I also think that's a little bit fanciful and I think that there's a lot of emotional content around 
recycling, for instance, you know, and as my yes. dad, my old German dad says to me, he says, how much of that stuff do you really think is going to be recycled? And I say, well, not the pie pan that you didn't rinse out, and there's dirt and fingerprints all over it, Dad. You, you've got to rinse out the jar if you're going to put it in recycle. And, of course, no glass recycle in New Orleans. So I think some of it's a little bit r romantic um, about how we're really treading on the earth. But if we were more in alignment in our practice, like being outside some of the time and being aware of fairies and gnomes and the elements and even the planetary angels, we would be aware that consciousness is throughout the material world and there are many types of beings besides humans. And I think witches are naturally really in conversation with all of those other beings and it hurts us to harm them. But if you're not aware and you're living in a concrete box and you're, you're always on the phone and you're not participating in the real natural world, you lose your abilities to be in touch with all the other beings. And then I think you are harmful even without really knowing you are. So I think it's kind of a system of trying to stay in balance with the earth. And I think witches naturally are, are very good at it because we want to talk to the fairies too. My answer. Thank you. Blessed be. Blessed be. Levi. Um, I think every, I agree with Brian, every human being has a duty um, to take care of the environment. Because you're, there's, no, there's this weird language that humans tend to use post-enlightenment of nature is a separate thing from us. Right. But it's not. Mm -hmm. you know, you're a part of it. It's all interconnected. Right? That's how biomes work. Um, so I think that, um, I think that I would say two things. Number one, I really want to hammer home something Ellie said. Ellie talked about the romanticism of it, how a lot of it's not true. This is unfortunately, I think, a big point to bring up, which is there's no solution to the horrors of what we've done to the environment and to coming climate change issues that are going to be fixed by individual action. Period. Right. End of story. I don't care. You know, I get a lot of flag because I consider myself environmentally conscious because, but I consider myself environmentally conscious because of how I vote. Right, <laughs> not because of, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, whether or not mm -hmm, I use plastic mm -hmm, straws, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. There's a weird sort of Calvinism that exists amongst environmentalists in America where it's mm -hmm, like there mm -hmm. are sins you can't do mm -hmm. and if you do the right thing, you're blessed mm -hmm, and you're right. part of the elect, you know, part of the elect that you. shop at the right places and you've, you're a good person, quote unquote, right? With your paper straw. Um, all the paper straws in the world will not change anything. The only thing that changes things, and we have studies to show this, are like carbon emission taxes and, um, you know, basically you have to have a government that has enough strength to mm -hmm. force businesses mm -hmm. to not pollute. Period. End of story. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that we should sh shift environmentalism to individual action. I think it always should be this concept of it's a, it's a, it's a collective action. Period. Right? The second thing I want to add that I do think witchcraft can bring a special lens to is I believe a lot of the root of evil in this world is misogyny. And I think, you know, the absolute destruction of, of, um, of women has been part and parcel of the way we treat the earth. I think, you know, people, I think a lot of the worst excesses of late stage capitalism are male fantasies run rampant, right? You know, it's, um, it's the fantasies of a, of a male, priesthood and their male god and their male mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. you know exarchs and their male archons and their male executives and you know it's just this poisonous and then servants, ideology right? we, i have this song in my head the earth is our rich. mother oh, the <laughs> and the men still burn her <laughs> yes i remember that uh yeah that song with the burning time but i think um i think that that's a huge thing that we can do is also is empower women and i think if there's something we in a small way that um witchcraft has brought into the spirituality of the western world it's an appreciation for putting women in positions of authority i love that yeah beautiful thank you so what How we usually do, do at this point is we'll plug the call-ins and then Christine can ask her last question while people are queuing. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to call in and get in the queue and be one of the brave people that come up here, please have a question or two for all of us, including Christine, because mm -hmm. she'll join the panel at that point right. in time for your questions. And please make sure it's a question and not a story, because Levi will get cross. The number <laughs> is... 309 goddess it's on your screen get in the queue now so christine your last question okay this is for each of you and we'll start this time with ellie 
The question is, what do you feel is the largest ethical challenge you face in your practice? In my practice, the largest ethical challenge I face. Well, the biggest things are outside my practice, like to my dad and not just tying a rock to him and putting him out into the river to go away. <laughs> Sorry, he's 92. You know, it's just, I talk about it too much, but it's really getting on my nerves. Um, it's been a day. So that's not in my practice, you know. That's, that's a separate thing. Um, although, oh, it, although he's good, he did say, he, he's trying to learn the schedule. I said, no, Dad, on Thursdays I go back into the shop and we, we film a podcast with witches. And he goes, your witches, the coven witches? And I'm like, yes, these people, you've met them, you, you know, they've been over. And he's like, every week? And I said, no, not every week, but just when you're being particularly troublesome, Dad, is one of the days I have to go do it. In my practice, oh my gosh, I don't know how to go first. Do you want to hand off and come back? Yeah, I want to come back. Levi, go next. You cheater! <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know in my practice. I can't even think of a, of a thing that's a, it's an ethical challenge. Um just to try to keep being really nice sometimes when people are being crappy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know challenge. your ethical challenge. Your ethical challenge is not to look at people as sort of like the empty please. I, you know I, what I mean? Like, really, no, it's, it's probably elitism. You're probably exactly right about that. Just being elitist and intelligentsia and better than and not snobby. That's a good answer. I'll take that. Uh, answer number three, to not be snobby and elitist in my own practice. Blessed be. Blessed be. Levi. My biggest ethical challenge in my own practice is that I have chosen to devote my life to a religion. I have chosen to devote my life to an initiation. And yet I also live in a world where that is increasingly uncommon and bizarre. You know, if, uh, if I had been in a different world, you know, maybe I would have been a monk or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's like, or a priest in a temple, you know, and, but because of the world I live in, I it is sometimes very difficult to have this split life between I really do believe that like I am doing the great work, I'm trying to teach others to do the great work, I am communing with the great mother, I am trying to um, you know serve at her altar and grow thurgically into in, into a being that will be reborn in her service, you know, in eternity, and you know into ecstasy and Elysium, you know, whatever that might mean. But, uh, but I also, like, have a corporate job, and also, like, I have to go get Diet Coke at the CVS because I ran out, and I also have to, like, buy a house, which I did, and, like, you yeah. know, and so I I think that sometimes it's a struggle because we, we are basically sort of, like, um, we are priests in exile, you know, that, that is what it means to be an initiate of witchcraft. And it's part of our mythology, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the Christians won. That's part of the mythology. Well, I'm not saying it's true. And we've had that discussion a thousand times on Covendom. It's irrelevant to me if it's true or not. The whole burning times, secret religion, Margaret Murray thesis or whatever. I don't care whether or not it's true. Historically, it's true to me spiritually. And so I do think we carry that as a dilemma that we are pre a priesthood in exile, right? You know, our temples are in our homes. We cast them out of the ether, you know, with, by sheer will and mm -hmm. faith alone. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. And there's so much power in that. But it's daunting sometimes. And it's very easy to slip into this, I just don't care anymore. I don't want to do that. I'm tired. Like, I have all the, these responsibilities and nobody seems to care about the great goddess anymore. And I'm so yeah. alone. And... And that, I think, is the great ethical challenge, is to maintain the faith, even in the face. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, because that mythology is real on a psychological level, because, like, the witch hunters still exist. They're just something else now. More and more. You know, like, the fires still burn, but, like, it's symbolic, right? It's the fire of late-stage consumerism, the fire of a dying earth, the fire of being in, living in one of the places that will be the first to experience climate change in its most catastrophic formation. So, like, I think that is the great ethical challenge. It's like I have to, I have to keep my ethics and not let them be whittled away by the unbelievers, by those that I am. Um, you know, talking about elitism, I used to have this phrase I said a lot where I used to, something, anything I hated, like a bad song, a crappy driver, I would just be like, you know what? That lives outside the mysteries. You know, like, I would, just, I would say that about everything. I'd be like, oh, God, look at that. That's outside the mysteries. And it's like, yeah, but I have to live outside the mysteries sometimes too, but I also 
don't ever want to leave them. So that's My, that's the challenge. I love the challenge of bringing witchcraft down into the material world. I mean, we yeah, have it's to a do challenge. It. We have to do it all the time, and just to embrace it and live it and stand up with our pentagrams or whatever, our our rose egg and. Say, yes, this is me. This is what I'm doing. This is what I believe in. This is real. And I'm riding in your Uber on my way to talk about this and do this publicly. I don't know. I feel pretty empowered from it. Not worn out. Not worn out. (laughs) Oh, no. Sometimes you do feel wonderfully empowered. But we all have those days. Yeah. Blessed be. Blessed be. Well, I I must say I love the phrase um, priests in exile. Explains Mm -hmm. uh, feelings I've had for a long time. So there's two there's two parts to this. One I'd say because one is not really one is sort of a strange ethical quandary, and it's more of an emotional feeling. I find it very difficult to live on Avalon and care about people outside of it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. You know, I live a very cloistered life. I'd say ninety percent of my energy goes into interacting with initiates. And um, only at store events or festivals do I generally tend to ever interact with anyone outside of, of that. And I realize that's paramount to the work that I'm doing. And I couldn't do the work that I'm doing if I wasn't cloistered. However, sometimes it does kind of take one on weird trips, you know, because there's a part of me that would love to be more of a priest on the streets and love to uh, to do that. But I, that's why I do things like this podcast is because it's an uh, opportunity for me to, to interact with other people. So that's one that sometimes I wonder, am I too cloistered? Um, but I don't know how I could do what I'm doing right now and not be. Um, the other one is a challenge I think all teachers have, surviving the massive disappointments. Oh, you know? I... Can we all just like take a minute? <laughs> all four of us have experienced it. Like, just breathe it in, sit with uh, it, let it be in the room with you. Let it go. Ooh. Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. <sighs> Thankfully, for, and I could speak for everyone here, I believe. Thankfully for all of us, it's been far and few between. <laughs> but when it does happen, it's, you know, I can see why I've, I've known priesthood who have stopped working, stopped leading covens because of disappointment. You know, because somebody sh- somebody betrayed so much, or because a group fell apart, or and they lost their will because it's you know we're doing it for free. It's an enormous right. amount of energy. Right. So when you do have the occasional bad egg, you know it it's haunting, um, and you wish you could kill them. You know, you wish you could have them put into an oak tree alive, and set on fire. But unfortunately, we can't. Oh, so the good old days. But not goats. <laughs> not goats. Just, just the people the who are disappointed. The good old days when we used to be able to kill them to make the grain <laughs> grow. <laughs> it's an ethical divide when you have to put up with them. Um, but yeah, thankfully, it's far and few between. So, and, and I know that um, even our challenges and disappointments are teaching tools. But I'd say those are my biggest struggles. And sometimes I think, oh, how am I still persisting? You know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. First, I had a hard time thinking of anything, so that's good. How that's much possible. wine we have to drink? Holy mackerel, that's a well, lot. I don't consider that ethical. I consider it um, tools of the trade. Tools of the <laughs> trade, but we got to keep them sharp. My Jesus. we got to keep them so, sharp. I want to say real quick, uh, we don't have a caller in the queue, but if you do want to call in, 309-463-3377, make sure that you answer the little prompt that it asks you. It'll be transcribed and we can see it. Also, if I missed, because... We, th- for some reason, Christine, well, I know not for some reason, for a very good reason, your questions have been so excellent. Some amazing conversations have happened in the chat, both yeah. through Facebook and YouTube. Just, you've really got people like out in this one. And um, so I might have, I, it's hard for me to scroll back. So if you have a really burning question and you don't want to call in and you won't, or you're in a place where you can't, you can put it in the chat through YouTube or Facebook. I'll see it. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it before, but again, a lot of convo around these questions. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I would say if everybody's on board, uh, while we wait for either a caller or those questions to load in the chat, do you want to ask another one that you had pre-prepared, Christine? Because they've been so good. I can. Yeah, because they just. How I'm, many did you make? <laughs> I've just been enjoying have them. They're met, so good. Have you missed? Oh. Right. You said seven. I had at least ten. Right. Virgo. Well, wow. I'm not even Virgo. Like a believer in sun signs like that in the same way as most people, but, but still. Please, people, go back and read the chat. Fabulous conversation. Yeah. Great points being made. I mean, I can everyone 
if they log in on Facebook or, or Hex Education, can they see all the comments? On YouTube, they can. And, on YouTube, um, okay. On some of the they can. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Facebook, they go away eventually. But we do like it when you call in. Mm-hmm. Would you like to hear the mm-hmm. brave mm-hmm. one? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so after in. Levi, Levi yeah, yelling at people last week, they're probably all afraid. Only the one. I will smite you. I will smite you all. <laughs> These are not the ways of the goddess I serve. So we've had a lot of conversation tonight about ethics and our magical practice. In everything that we've talked about tonight, what's one thing either you've read in the comments or that you've heard another presenter say that you will take into your magic practice to make it more ethical? I can't read the comments. That's not fair. Mm. (laughs) You'll just have to go for our our fantastic statements then. Who do you want us to start with, Miss Christine? I think we should start with Levi because he's ready with an answer. Sure. Um, Something someone has said that will stick with me in my own ethical practice or something in the Mm -hmm. comments. Um, Hmm. While you're thinking, may I answer this one? Yes, please. The biggest, most resonant thing that I heard in today is, although we may be a socially attached community, we all have our communities of magical practice. And we have our own practices that travel in their own circles. So when Brian said, we are not a community, he was absolutely right. To me, we are many communities, and I need to remember that. What is right for me as an Alexandrian priestess, what I do in my practice, what we do in our practices, I am going to focus on that because what is it that they say, what other people have to say about me is none of my business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the thing. What is going on in other people's traditions that I do not find to the point where, you know, if you're doing something to small children or you're setting goats on fire, sure. yes, you and I are going to have a conversation but that's going to have a lot to do with you being a human, not because of any religion you practice. Mm -hmm. We are a community of people who have chosen religions outside the norm. Yes, we are. But within our magical practices, we have our own communities and we need to respect that. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. that one of the things that I say about that, we have more banter on this section, is that the reason why I've often challenged this community thing, pagan community, magical community, witchcraft community, you know, that we have fleeting moments like Hexfest. I think we become for a weekend a weird little community every year, but then yeah. it goes away. It's not really a real community. It's a temporary right. kind of sort of thing. Um, well, but in a way, yeah, we attached these... to all these people year round, though. I do. I know a lot of them. I do know some of them. Yeah. There are ones yeah. I don't ever yeah. want to see again. Um, <laughs> you know, it's. It's oh, sort of fine. one of, I know they're paying me, but that's not the point. So if you're paying me, you can come. Um, the reality of it is, though, is that, yeah, we're not all one thing. And there's this weird thing that started years ago and it's gotten worse. And it's kind of like Levi, like, I'm not anti voodoo. In fact, I think it's probably the most ethical ATR that I know of, really, um, like real voodoo. Um, and I've had a couple friends who are really into it. However, there's things like Palo that I find mm, no, very problematic for me right? Uh, Satanists, don't mind Satanists. Sometimes I just think they're pissed off Christians, you know, but my point is they're not, it's not witchcraft. (coughs) Neither one of these things are witchcraft and I'm not involved in their practices and I'm, you're not going to find me rolling on to uh, Anton LaVey Facebook group and sharing my opinions, you know, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately though, there are certain things like, I mean, I think there was an entire Corellian a coven that wanted Christine to just take them on. I'm like, one of these things is not like the other. This is not <laughs> how this works, you know, but it's this delusion that that, that would happen even. We're just going to be like, yeah, we're all the same thing. Let's all work together. No, you know, so I think it's just dangerous. Uh, I think it breeds um, unintelligent conversation and uninvited discourse to always have this, we are one. Yeah. So, because we're not. Right. Uh, the average pagan has no, their opinion on Alexandrian witchcraft has no value at all. Damn, that it's valid. It, I mean. They can't, it can't, they can't know, they don't know, they can't have an opinion, they're not an initiate. Yeah, I think a big thing I'm going to take away, because I, I, I did, you know, as Ellie announced at the beginning, and just, you know, um, purchased a home I'm moving this month, is how important it is 
to realize that you do have to have your home life functional. Yes. Right? That you do have to have your house in order Mm -hmm. because it's very Mm -hmm. hard sometimes Mm -hmm. to even Mm -hmm. consider ethical decisions or to consider how you want to grow or to consider how you want to grow as a person or a priest or whatever when you're constantly bogged down by a poorly managed life. And I've been guilty of that. You know, a lot of chaos this year for me. And so sometimes I find myself in bad habits and just, you know, poor ways of thinking or acting. And so that's something I want to take away is to remind myself of what Ellie was talking about, that sort of like you have to have that soft solid hearth base before you can start expanding in new ways and you can do magic for yourself in that way yeah. because it does strengthen your mm-hmm. fortifications and it yeah. strengthens your base what about you miss ellie what are you going to take away because we do have questions in the I'm chat gonna on the ta- i'm going to take away that christine beautiful christine had this whole subject because it's going to put it in my mind more and i am in front of the public all day long and a lot of people do come to us as readers for ethical guidance even though it's they're not really saying that they're looking for am i guilty am i bad do you think i'm okay if i do this and i'm going to really spend some more time thinking about about my platform and how I answer. I don't answer from my own ego because I'm re- reading for someone, so I'm trying to connect to their holy guardian angel or their higher mind. But I do think I could come back with a little bit more standardized ideas for to pass on to people, definitely. Okay. Thank you. So I say we start with Christine, um, since she is our guest. Uh, Jamie asked, at what point is an initiate un- so unethical for you that it would be c- you would consider removing them from the group? And how would you have handled that? Mm. Well, uh, as an Alexandrian priestess, we have ways of handling things, which I'm not going to go into here. But realistically, we've got some very key tenets. We have oath-bound materials that are specifically for the Alexandrian initiates and priesthood, which means if you are sharing these things, if you are sharing oath-bound materials, that is a conversation that we are going to have. And it, yes, most definitely. Um, the other thing is if you are living a life that goes against everything that you're magically trying to do. So if you're saying, I worship the goddess and you're a raging misogynist, we're going to have a problem. We are going to absolutely have those conversations. Uh, Step one is never removing somebody from a group because, you know, we invest in our, in our initiates, in our priesthood, but it's going to be a very strong conversation of you have, you know, sworn oaths to these things. Everything that you're doing is counter to these things. I'd like to have a conversation about how you're going to rectify this. Okay. Mm-hmm. What would you say to that question, Brian? Well, um, you know, I've never, uh, as an Alexandrian, removed anyone from a group through formal means. Um, however, we have had people we've sort of had to advise out of the group, I guess you could say. There is one in particular individual I probably should have kicked to the curb, but I didn't. I'm not going to say who it is, obviously. Um, I think if you're doing things that are what witchcraft would consider a sin, um, I think if people start uh, spreading themselves out into other traditions and things like that, I think I'd be quicker to act now um, than I was at that time. I think I was a little too patient sometimes. And I've always believed you can only serve at one altar. If you're a priest or priestess, you should be de- fully dedicated to that thing, whatever it is. I don't really believe in. And I find people who do split are always problematic, probably for both, probably not just for us. Mm-hmm. So now I think I'd kick someone to the curb for doing that. Mm-hmm. But you know, I haven't. I haven't previously. So I do believe in being patient. If you brought someone in, if they've taken the oaths that they're still dedicated. You know, you've got to give people room to grow, to make their own mistakes. Um, and you have to realize that not everyone is going to go into higher service. I think mm-hmm. there's yeah. this mm-hmm. mistake that's made sometimes that that has to be what happens. And it's usually not what happens. And if you know, if you have the knowledge, which we all do, that it's usually not what happens, and sometimes should have never have happened, well, then what is the purpose of it? Because it's not just about that, is it? Right. It's yeah. about the development of the soul and not everyone needs to be a teacher and not everyone needs to run a group. That's a big. That's a big. Ellie. 
kick, kicking someone out when they've broken the ethics too much. Yeah. Well, you know me, I'm pretty strict. I'm, I'm known for that. I think I'd be doing like Christine. I'd be doing some serious talking to, and I'd have them make some decisions about their behavior and their practices and what they've signed up to do in our tradition. And if they failed three times, I would ask them to leave. I probably would. I think I'd be pretty strict about it. Um, I've not had to deal with this in the, in the sense that I've never had to do it. Something I do think that I can share that, I, in my opinion, you know, Brian, scream at me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't consider this oath bound because Brian's talked about it publicly and a few other people. We do not have a form of uninitiating someone. No. And wh- what I mean by that mm-hmm. is, is um, it is well known that there are other lineages of witchcraft that do have a concept of excommunication. Mm-hmm. But they're not, they're not in agreement about that now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's a whole it's debate. But yeah. I have told my own initiates when we have had t- friend, you know, like f- we've had a little bit of friction, no big ethical issues ever. But in, f- in fractious moments, I have said to them, I can't uninitiate you. You're always going to be a priest or a priestess. Mm-hmm. But the, it's your responsibility to live that out. Like I can't. Well, one of must other yeah. remember an initiation can equally be a curse if it's not. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And that's what I'm getting at is this idea of I try to tell people before they're initiated. I try to tell them this is for this life for you know I'm not going to say cosmically forever, but this is for the rest of your life. Even if you stop practicing the day after you're initiated mm-hmm. and never touch it again, you're mm-hmm. always going to be a priest. It still happened to you. It still happened. Mm-hmm. I do believe there is a spiritual thing mm-hmm. that is happening mm-hmm. that I can't go into too much detail about, but I do believe it happens. So removing someone does not remove their priesthood, right? It removes their ability to live with it, and it becomes exactly what I was going to say, which is what Brian said, which is I think it almost becomes a kind of curse. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think people, it reminds me of, you know, Kirk before he died. He was obsessed with a Bible verse that has always been one of my favorite Bible verses, which is work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. You know, um, and it's uh, it's St. Paul says that in his letters and the epistles, he says, work out your own salvation and fear and trembling. Like, and that is kind of the mentality I have sometimes is like, if I, rem- if I had to go, go so far as to kick someone out for being unethical, like if they were um, violent, if they were a rapist, mm-hmm. if they were somebody mm-hmm. who was, you know, mm-hmm. harmful and, and had broken ethics in an unforgivable kind of way, I would kind of have that mentality of go with God, honey. It's not going to be pleasant. But you'd, I would tell what the craft, too. what the craft has, which has been pretty well publicized is banishment from the coven. You know, that would be the formal, the formal thing. And back in the old days, when everyone was still in merry old England, if you were in a coven, you were a lucky period. So if you were banished from one, most likely most witches wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole. You know, and so your only road home, uh, assuming you even had options, was to get in good with your group again. And usually there was a road home made, unless the offense was so grievous that there couldn't be a conversation, right? So, but you would have to be sorry for what you did and you'd have to go on bended knee, you know, to get a chance of getting back in. And sometimes it was for time periods. We do have yeah. a call. Just, just wanted to let you know. That's it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So we have a call. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, hello. Hi, who's yes, this? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Oh, good. Hi, I'm Craig. Um, look, I've got a quick question. Well, it might not be quick, but I have a question anyway. Sure. Um, if, uh, if you've got something like environmentalism or um, the uh, diversity and inclusive, inclusivity movement and so forth, all with their own merits and so forth, do you think there might be uh, an issue when um, those issues sort of overwhelm the um, sort of doctrine of the craft itself in some cases, like the tail wagging the dog? I've okay. seen a little bit of this lately. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. So, Just want to know what uh, your take on this. Yeah. So I think the big example, like I know that uh, the big example we've seen a lot is trans inclusivity and non-binary folks and whatnot in traditional craft. I think you also see this with what I mentioned, white initiates into ATRs. So, what do you think, yeah. panel, about um, when social inclusivity movements start to encroach upon the religion itself? Ellie. Well, I don't think. Oh, Brian. Pa- sorry. No, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I don't think politics should really be brought into a coven. Um, I think that it's our job to promote the beliefs of the craft um, and leave the rest to the world. I I like that idea, too. I would say that the gods of a tradition call you, and you have a very strong tendency to want to work for them in a religious capacity, and that 
most of us do have some political alliances, whether it's uh, environmental or social, um, and we should work for those things, but I believe we should keep them separate and keep them out of our religious tradition politically um, and maybe have conversations about what they're implying inside a coven. Yeah. I, I think those are some really important questions, but not let, as you said, not let the tail wag the dog. The religion comes first. If you want to buy into that, if you want to be initiated, if you want to do it, do it, and then work on your politics in a separate area and don't make the religion f format itself to your politics. Christine? Well said. <laughs> when I think about, especially like environmentalism and things like that that are very current, I also think about how to work that into my craft, but I don't, change the craft to suit the initiative. I focus on where are we in the wheel of the year? What type of thing might I be able to accomplish leveraging what I know in my craft and what teachings that we can use to teach initiates, leveraging these lessons. As things begin to grow, obviously we think about the earth and we think about everything. As things begin to die, we have these same conversations. So viewing these environmental issues through the lens of the craft I think is appropriate. Viewing the craft through the lens of environmentalism, no. Less it be. Less right. it be. Mm -hmm. Craig, Very good. Craig, you're in Australia, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So um, I think this is a this is an issue that is um, all over the Anglosphere, and it was a particularly American disease, which is the idea that politics is a new religion, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Politics is. Yeah. People do this weird thing in America, and it has spread like a virus to other cultures because of American mass media. People do this thing in America where they think politics is this weird sacrosanct thing that exists apart from who you are as a person. That's nonsense. There are no such things as political values that are not also moral values. Right. There's no such thing. It does not exist. Indeed. So, like, if I support a woman's right to have access to a safe abortion... That's not a political value of mine. It's a moral value of mine, right? It's a religious value of mine. So they're not separable. So like I would, I would not initiate someone who I knew publicly, publicly was a misogynist. And in my opinion, that is not a political choice that I'm making. It is a religious one because I'm going to allow that person to kneel, if they're a man, in front of a woman and worship her as the living incarnation of God. I'm not going to allow somebody who go who tr who would treat that woman as a second right. class citizen outside of the circle, right. because it's not political. Mm -hmm. I agree with what Christine and Brian and Ellie everyone has been saying, which is my politics are. I, I don't. I think this also suffers, Craig, from the amount of contemporary witches who view witchcraft as a spiritual yeah, technology. Sorry, sorry, the amount. The amount of what? The amount of contemporary witches. The amount of what? I'd yeah, contemporary witches uh, yes, yes. who who view their witchcraft as a sort of um, external identity that they take on as a spiritual technology instead of a core path that informs uh, their, yeah. their being. Identitarianism so, yeah. is a curse. Yeah, so uh, so that's sort of like what I think is my um, is my worldview is like I don't approach these things like Christine and Brian and Ellie have been saying as external. Mm -hmm. So like, you know. If you want to argue about taxes, that's different. But moral questions, yeah, that's what that would be my answer. But thank you for that question. Well, that was a good question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're almost out of time. Okay. Thank you for okay. calling in. Yes, thank you, Craig. Craig. Thank you, Craig. So before we uh, announce next week, let's go ahead and plug Christine one last time. Right. Christine is an Alexandrian high priestess who lives in Ohio. Ellie, would you want to do this? Christine is an Alexandrian high priestess that lives in Ohio, and she's <laughs> on Facebook, and she is already said we can follow her. Do you have a friends and a follow page, Christine, or just a friends page? I have just a friends page, but they can find me on Instagram, on Facebook, um, and go ahead and message me on Facebook. I will respond. I have responded. So if you have questions, you want to chat, feel free to reach out. And if you're in the Midwest, most definitely reach out. Mm -hmm. Christine, if you have people in your area who are sincerely interested in craft training, would you be open to conversations about that? 
I would be interested in conversations most definitely. Beautiful. Levi's face is like he never stops. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so next week we are actually going to be having our ambush interview be Lilith Dorsey. Oh, we don't yay. know what the interview will be. Mm -hmm. She is a New Orleans voodoo priestess and one of my favorite magical people in New Orleans. And so as you can see, we are friends. <laughs> um, so we'll be doing that and I'm very excited and then we're going to have um, one more episode and then we'll be taking a break until after October yes. so two more episodes to go you'll be back here we'll next break. week will you be back here next I, Thursday I will be back come back Sunday I believe Ooh, yeah. we'll all be together in our spots all and side by I side. want to end uh, by before before I hit this little end thing by just saying Christine what fabulous questions what, fabulous what a questions. joy to have you with us tonight it was absolutely wonderful the comments I, I highly recommend Christine you go read them you you it would be a wonderful experience for you because this was just a beautiful show and they were excellent well thought out questions so thank you it was thank very you. good thank, thank you, you. Have, have a great week